Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to a very special episode of the 3D game programming tutorial series. Today, we're not going to be focusing so much on coding something incredible for once. Instead, we're going to take a break from the code. We're going to take a look at assets. How can we take assets out of some artistic pipeline and put them into the game? doesn't matter what the artistic asset is. And this is an important topic, because otherwise, how are you going to get anything into your game? So that's what we're going to look at in this video. We're going to take a look at the best practices for getting textures into your game in the best quality and the best performance overall, and same general principle for models. We're going to take a look at how to take models from an existing pipeline into our game. So there you go. Let's get to it. Good news, everyone. We now have enough of the render pipeline in place that we can take a look at how to produce assets for this game. Now, we're not going to go too in-depth into asset creation right now. Instead, I'm just going to show you the basics of what to do to get an asset ready to use for our game. So for our example, I'm going to go into our res folder and textures, and I'm going to use our bricks2.jpg as an example. I'm going to open that with GIMP. So let's say, for example, this is our texture. We've created it. We've done a whole painstaking process of making it. We have it. We're ready. We want to put this texture in our game. What do we do? Well, the best way to put it in our game is once you have it completely ready, export it in the DDS texture format. Why the DDS format specifically? Because this can be loaded pretty much directly into the game. And we'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but right now I just want to talk about how to save it, because it's a bit tricky. By default, most image editors do not have a way to save into the DDS format. For GIMP, there's a plugin for it. I will see if I can find a link to it and leave it in the description. Photoshop also has a plugin for it, so you will need a plugin for it, but believe me, it is worth it. DDS textures will make your life a whole lot easier. So I'm going to go ahead and save this as bricks2.dds. Once you have the plugin installed, this will show up, and I can click export. There are several options. For compression, for something like this, you typically want compression. It will make your texture smaller, it will make huge loss in quality, and it will make it both load and run a hell of a lot faster. There will be a noticeable performance difference. And you usually want DXT1 if you don't have transparency. If you have no transparency, DXT1. If you have transparency, DXT5. But there's no transparency, so DXT1. Format and save it fine. MIP maps. Again, if it's a texture, if you're going to be viewing it at various distances, yes, generate MIP maps. And there's another cool thing about DDS. You can save MIP maps directly in the texture, so you don't need to generate them at runtime saves a bit of load time. These, these load ridiculously fast. Now the filter for generating the mid-maps, I tend to prefer the Langzos filter because there's actually been a few scientific studies showing that this tends to, on average, have the best perceptual quality of the various filtering techniques. So that's why I prefer that. And speaking of perceptual, there's also this perceptual error metric you can use. Typically, you want it on, but if things look weird, it's safe to turn it off. If this gets really weird sharp edges, this can create bizarre artifacts. So sometimes it works better with it off. I find it typically works better with it on. But yeah. And those are all the parameters you want to screw with. Once you have that, you have your texture exported, ready to go. You can go straight into the code to use this. One thing to be careful of, though, depending on what you're building on, what platform you're running on, the res folder may not be here. It may be under your build folder. And if it's under your build folder, if it's not just a shortcut, then you'll need to make sure that, yeah, this actually is in your build folder's res folder. This one. Or else you'll get a runtime error. So that's something I've tried to keep to a minimum in recent builds. Hopefully that doesn't happen for too many people, but that can happen right now. It's an unfortunate just side effect of trying to be compatible with everything. So just be careful with that. And yeah, under main.cpp, we can do something with this. I can 
go where DDS texture is, I can say if not DDS texture, right now I'm creating a texture with my existing DS texture. I can try loading bricks2.jpg using the same sort of code. I can create another texture, same sort of code, call it texture2. Boom. This will load the texture blazingly fast. We get all the net maps and texture compression for free. And it's loads faster, it runs faster. It's typically just a really good time. This is there's no decompression here. This is literally just taking the data from the file and funneling it to the GPU to use. So it is an awesome way to do textures. Highly recommended. Definitely by far my recommended way to have textures and graphics in your game. Alright, time for the next big asset creation question. How do you create meshes for this game? So, I'm going to do this in Blender. You can do this in your favorite 3D model editor. Doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to need an example mesh. So I'm going to use a cube. And just to make it vaguely more interesting, I'm going to scale it down to one-tenth the size. Does it really matter? Not really, since our game has scaling features. But we're doing it anyways, because that's just how we are. So let's say this is our amazing... Amazing. This is our amazing mesh that our artists have worked ages on to create. We want to put it in our game. What do we do? Well, first thing, what you want to do is you want to tab on over to edit mode and you want to make sure you have UVs for your texture. The default model loader assumes you have normals and UVs for your mesh. So if you don't have that, you're going to get a crash at load time. So what I want to do is I want to unwrap. I'm just going to do Basic unwrap for more complicated mesh. You could do a smart UV unwrap that typically does very well. It's a great place to base your texture. Yeah, making. I'm going to do basic though. So if a basic unwrap, if I switch over to our UV editing view, you see it's just put all the UVs over everything. So every face will be the entire texture of whatever texture we're drawing on it. Pretty straightforward. And that's the biggest gotcha out there. The other gotcha, if you have a smooth mesh, you want to make sure you have smooth shading. For a cube, it doesn't really matter too much. If I had a smoother mesh, I'll just show you briefly. I'm going to put on a, where is it? Subdivision surface. We're going to subdivide a whole bunch of times to make our cube into a sphere because we are that cool. Yeah, once you have a lot of subdivisions, then it makes the lighting a whole lot nicer. If I turn it back to flat, well, probably turn it back a bit. You see, it gets a bunch of flat faces and doesn't look nice. So, turn it to smooth, very nice smooth looking. Turn it to flat, very ugly looking. But I'm going to delete this. We just want the basic cube. So you make sure your shading model is set to, to what you want it to. That affects how the normals will be generated for your mesh. So beyond that, we can just straight up export. You can, I'm pretty sure just about all these formats are supported. I'm going to export in the basic OBJ format, just because. I'll call this tinycube.obj. Now, what about the parameters for exporting? It doesn't matter too much. For not too complicated meshes like this, I prefer to triangulate in the model editor. You don't need this with Asimp. Asimp will triangulate for you, so you could just leave this as it is. But for simple meshes, I prefer to triangulate because it doesn't take up that much extra memory. So why not? Beyond this, you want to make sure normals and UVs are written. And that's about it. So I should be able to export this. And now we can move it in to our game. So we have our amazing model. It's exported. How do we put it in the game? Well, as before, we need to go to the resource folder. And need to be careful to make sure it's the resource folder in the build, if that exists. If it's a shortcut, it's okay to use the resource folder here. If not, it has to be in the build. Something to be careful of. So I'm going to go to the models folder. I'm going to copy our cube and just move it in there. In fact, by copy, I mean I'm just directly moving it in there. So there you go. We now have tinycube.obj in our models. By the way, Nothing is enforcing this folder structure. This is just my default organization. And it's very possible we will rearrange this as the game goes on. In fact, I dare say it's even likely we will change this up as the game comes along. 
But for now, this is how things are laid out. So under models, we now have this. We have the material, but right now we haven't really done anything with the material. I'm not going to talk about that yet because the game isn't there yet. We'll deal with materials when that becomes an issue. For now, we just have the object. That's what matters. So once we have the object, what we can do is actually we can do something kind of cool. We have our model loader load models. It's loading them into these arrays. And since right now I know there's only one model per file, I can do something kind of cool. I can load models. I can load tinycube.obj, right? And from there, what I can do is this is now just placed that next model in this models array. So model sub zero used to be monkey. See right here, vertex array created with model sub zero. I can create another vertex array. I'll call it vertex array two because I don't have any crazy names. And I can set that to models sub one, which is now tiny cube. So that's kind of cool. And there's nothing else to it. Obviously, in reality, you'll probably have more advanced re resource management than this in your game. You'll probably want to have better names for things too. But this is giving you the idea. You now see how to take things from your artistic pipeline, from your image editor, your model editor, whatever, and you can export them and move them into your game. You can use external resources efficiently now. There you go. One last thing we can do, just to show this off a little bit better, is we can mess around with our renderable mesh, just to show off what this looks like in-game now that we've done it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the vertex array to our tiny cube. So our vertex array is now going to be a dress of vertex array 2, which is what we set as tiny cube. In fact, I'm going to name this tiny cube vertex array because that's a significantly better name. So address of tiny cube vertex array, there you go. And texture 2, I can actually probably also rename. I can just name this bricks 2 texture. Sure, that probably gets the job done. Again, we'll, we'll tackle resource management at some point, but that's not what we're doing right now. So renderable mesh dot texture. That's going to be actually, let's make this a little bit more interesting. We're going to make it slightly random. So if a random value is greater than 0.5, then we're going to set it to address of texture. Otherwise, we'll set it to address of bricks to texture. There you go. Now I can close out of this, make and run, and we should see, hey, a bunch of tiny cubes which all have the same, what? Ah, and the issue was dead simple. I created the entity before I updated the mesh. So there's that. And one final thing to watch out for, this should be fixed for most of you. But some early versions of the starting code had a minor bug in them with DDS texture where they did not have this line. They did not clean up the texture before allocating a new buffer. It's a minor issue. It shouldn't cause functional differences, but it will cause a memory leak. So just make sure you have this in there. If you happen to be someone who had a really early version of the starting code. Yeah, there's that. And with that, now we can make it run. And hey, look at that. Now we have a bunch of tiny cubes all around the world, and they all have a bunch of tiny textures on them. And texture loading, basically instant. It is amazing. One more thing I want to point out, though, just along the lines of textures, is something you might be concerned with is, hey, Benny, JPEGs and stuff make really tiny textures. Is DDS going to make really big textures? I mean... They're typically bigger than JPEGs, but not by much. Bricks.jpegs, uh, just under 160 kilobytes. Bricks.dds, about 175 kilobytes, so not a huge difference. Bricks2.jpeg, 168 kilobytes. Bricks2.dds, also about 175 kilobytes, so the compression level tends to be pretty comparable. So you probably 
are still going to be okay as far as memory usage, if that is your concern. Not that this would really save you from memory usage on once it's in memory, but if your concern is disk space, really, disk space usage, probably not going to be an issue. 